Uh, that was I, I, the last time I saw a greeting like that. I think it was the Shah of Iran who came in. To, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> it's great, Henry. Thank you so much. And you can see the huge crowd that wants to hear your thoughts this afternoon. Uh, I I am with them. This is a. We didn't intend to have this come right after a very tumultuous weekend, uh, but it did. And it was a weekend where all of us were kind of shaken and had to think about the fundamentals. Uh, we asked you to come initially to share with us your thoughts about what it means, this new dynamic with uh, Iran. But we have a new dynamic throughout the region. Uh, can I just ask you to open up with your thoughts about this weekend and what it means? What, what does this last weekend mean for all of us? Of course, uh, let me say you, uh, this is a great example of John's negotiating tactics. When he invited me, I, he gave me no idea of the size of the group, the magnitude of the group, <laughs> that many ambassadors would be here, newsmen, the perfect setting for a suicide. <laughs> 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 So I, uh, whatever it is you will hear, it's improvised. <laughs> and uh, so the, uh, the reaction to this week's event, the weekend event. <clears throat> On the one hand, it is no different from several events like this we have seen in New York, in London, in Madrid, and now in Paris, where we've seen a similar event before. But at the same time, the uh, brutality and the imperviousness to the feelings of the victims uh, is uh, particularly shocking. And uh, that this would happen in a capital of Europe that has had close connections with the Arab world and has on the whole been extremely understanding. Uh, so I put, I, I think it is a challenge really to the future of Europe in this sense. When one looks at the immigration problem that faces Europe, which really has the aspect of frontiers that are essentially open, and the aspect of, of a possible cultural transformation of the whole region. And now this challenge to a capital that has so long been a symbol in the, on the continent of the political evolution of Europe, uh, it sort of raises the question whether this is the sort of challenge that should 
compel Europe, if that's still possible, to develop a strategic conception as a participant in international affairs and not to believe that soft power in, by itself can remedy the world or that Europe should be a passive, a more passive participant. It's really a challenge for Europe to help mm -hmm. define where we are and to participate as an active uh, member of the Western community in what is a fundamental challenge to our values mm -hmm. and our, in some ways our existence, our existence in the form in which we are. Uh, this, of course, coupled with sadness at the event itself, but in asking myself, where do we go from here? Uh, it isn't enough to be compassionate, and it isn't enough to say we stand by you. Uh, we have to develop what we are going to stand by for mm -hmm. and to do it uh, jointly. Henry, I, I, over the weekend I was in uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, for a big conference. Oh, can you hear? I'm sorry. Uh, over the weekend I was in the UAE for a conference on the Middle East and we talked about four the four crises that are underway. We have a crisis in Yemen, we have a crisis in Syria, we have a crisis in Iraq, we have a crisis in Libya. The region is on fire. Um, what do we do? Well, I think we have to begin by understanding the nature of the crisis. And it isn't one crisis, it is a number of crises occurring simultaneously. There is a crisis of governance in which the subjects of the, uh, of the region, uh, the people who are it, have lost faith in most of their governments. And so there is a tension between the subjects and the rulers. And that indeed was the beginning of the Syrian crisis. Mm -hmm. But then, when we thought of the Syrian crisis as a conflict between a ruler and a homogeneous population, we lost track of the other crises that are going on, namely, the f fact that many of these countries are composites of different ethnic and religious groupings, so that when the central authority is weakened, either by revolution or by uh, foreign pressures or by its own weakness, that what happens is not a homogeneous opposition within which you can apply democratic methods, <clears throat> but a conflict between these various ethnic and religious groups for predominance or sometimes even for self-preservation. In addition, as a third element, these ethnic and religious conflicts are not confined by national boundaries. So when they break out, they involve neighboring countries and sometimes uh, the whole region. And all of these various civil wars 
that are going on simultaneously are united by a rejection of the uh, world order that was created at the end of World War I so that one is seeing the collapse of national boundaries mm -hmm. side by side with the collapse of governing authority and therefore the rise of non-state groupings mm -hmm. that within countries and between countries are achieving a very strong and sometimes dominant position. And this is why ISIS is so significant, because it goes across national borders. It asserts universal claims. It uh, tries to make these universal claims uh, a means of overthrowing <clears throat> the whole international system. And it uses methods which in their shocking brutality are supposed to demonstrate the irrelevance of the existing system. And these, all these things are coming together. And so it's very difficult to say what is their one policy. Uh, that can uh, affect them because then uh, the one, the, well, the traditional states that exist in the, in the region, like I would say Egypt and Iran and Turkey, it is not fully in the region. And so the, the solution of these problems, or even the amelioration of these problems, is going to be linked to the emergence of these countries into a possibly dominant position. And uh, that is the aspect of the Iranian problem in addition to the nuclear uh, capacity. So this is the, a challenge which for Americans is very hard to understand because we believe that there is one single world order that follows uh, accepted principles that challenges have solutions that can be defined in a limited period of time and uh, yet, our challenge is to at least understand it and then to build a policy to which others can relate. Mm -hmm. Henry, you, um, you are uh, you, you're a very strategic thinker, and I'd like to ask your view on what do you think it means for the very dramatic way that Russia interjected itself into Syria. Now, this is a very different thing. And what does it mean? Well, I have <clears throat> a personal reaction in part because in 1973, the Middle East system <clears throat> that emerged from the Middle East war was substantially based on our previous effort of demonstrating that uh, political solutions could not be achieved by Russian military assistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that policy in, from 73, for about three decades, the uh, United States uh, had sort of the leading role in designing uh, the diplomatic issues and was an essential participant, uh, sometimes 
skillfully, sometimes less so, but nevertheless the United States was the dominant political element in the evolution uh, of the Middle East. So that the reappearance of Soviet military forces introduced without any consultation with the United States, symbolically even a day after Putin had appeared at the United Nations, represents a change in the balance of power uh, uh, that is uh, of symbolic and substantive significance. At the same time, uh, the capacity of Russia to be a dominant element in the region is limited. And uh, its capacity to undertake significant military operations by itself is prescribed, is prescribed by its economic uh, difficulties and its other, uh, its other problems. In my opinion, the strategic reason why Putin, or why Russia, I, I wouldn't, I don't really like to put it on yeah, one leader, yeah, yeah. why Russia re-entered the Middle East game, if one could call it that, is because one of the dominant strategic concerns of Russia is the impact of the Middle East on Russian domestic stability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the fear that if uh, non-state organizations with a radical Islamist content evolve in, uh, in the Middle East, they will sooner or later reach into Russia and that they will have a very fertile field in Russia. So uh, Russia is trying to prevent the emergence and the consolidation of this kind of radical Islamist uh, uh, direction. And in that respect, their objectives developed on their own are really parallel with ours. And uh, so I see a, a possibility, in fact, likelihood that we could come to an understanding with Russia about a parallel approach to ISIS. And especially if we make clear that if Russia pursues another course, uh, that we will be obliged to return to the pre-1973 policy of demonstrating the limits of their capacities. That would not be a desirable mm -hmm. alternative. And because in the long run, on the issue of, uh, uh, of radical Islam, our objectives should be parallel. Um, Henry, let me, let me follow up on this. Um, I'm, I'm having some difficulty discerning a strategy on the part of our government about what to do. But I also look at the, uh, the Republican candidates who are speaking, and I don't discern very much clarity there either. Um, so you are, you're a counselor to every president, I think, in the last 40 years. What would you say to any of them who right now would ask you, what should we do? Uh, let me just go back one, uh, one step to the previous question. Yes, sir. Uh, if, we, if there were to be a discussion with Russia about the future in the Middle East, it would have to include a 
discussion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. One cannot mm -hmm. imagine two uh, totally separate uh, uh, policies. You know, <laughs> the nature of our political contest now is with public opinion polls taking uh, uh, every week that the emphasis is on uh, immediate impact. Mm -hmm. And the problem we are discussing is a very long range problem. So what I'd probably say to a candidate, when they ask me is to say, everybody should drop the phrase, on my first day in office, <laughs> I will do the following thing. <laughs> if we can achieve that, we will have made a contribution. That would be a contribution. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a sense of reflection and perspective would be welcomed for all of our politicians, I would say. Henry, let me, let me go back to the topic that we originally asked you to address when we uh, invited you. And uh, this was, we did this several months ago. We saw the unfolding deal with Iran. Uh, this was a very big deal. It, uh, it, not just the organic issue of uh, the nuclear program, but the way in which it opens up political uh, opportunities for Iran in the region. It creates a different dynamic. Uh, many, I'll just say, having been in the Middle East the last three days, there are a lot of nervousness about this. Uh, what do you think about this deal? Not just the nuclear deal, but the way in which it creates a new geopolitical dynamic in the Gulf. Uh, when the deal was uh first proposed, I raised some questions about the uh, <clears throat> inspection provisions. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I think that has now been superseded by, by the uh, evolution. The, the more fundamental concern I had is what will follow afterwards. Uh, if this deal is interpreted in the region as an end to the non-proliferation efforts of the United States and of the world, <clears throat> and if then every uh, other state in the region attempts to develop or demand the same capabilities that Iran has achieved through the agreement, mm -hmm. then we will see a breakdown of the non-proliferation system. And then we will face a situation in which because of the short distances, because of the limited technological capability to cover the whole range of deterrence, uh, that a premium will be put on preemptive actions uh, between uh, these countries. And this should be a fundamental concern for us in the, few, in the next decade or so, that it is logical that the Sunni countries will think that they must strengthen their military capabilities vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis a growing Iranian uh, military and economic capability. So that's one aspect, that's the nuclear aspect. But even if, we, if one can avoid the spread of nuclear military technology, uh, if what emerges it's two blocks, a Sunni block and a Shia block. And if the Western countries and are attempting to maneuver between them, uh, to conduct a balance of power, 
policy between two countries is or between two blocks is extremely difficult. And if you look at the experience of Europe before World War I, when their system had congealed into two rigid, more or less rigid alliances, sooner or later it, uh, it becomes unmanageable. So that's the structural problem. And then the political long-range problem is that Iran is now governed by Ayatollahs. But it was an empire before Ayatollahs and an empire reaching from the borders of China uh, into, uh, into North Africa. So that dominating the region is not a new thought to educated Iranians and their uh, economic capacity and probably their military capacity is stronger than that of any other single uh, nation nation in in the region and their outreach today by supporting non-state actors in Lebanon, Yemen, uh, uh, Palestine, has given them a strategic base beyond the ideology of the, of the Ayatollahs. So in the minds of the Sunni states, there is a, a, a real threat. At the same time, it is also conceivable that as Iran evolves, that a more moderate perception of the international system uh, evolves with it. And for us, the challenge is to pursue two, on the face of it, contradictory policies at the same time. On the one hand, we have to stand by the Sunni countries that have been our allies and on whose uh, cooperation we have relied for many decades. And therefore, we have to set a limit to Iranian imperialism. But we also have to be prepared to engage in a dialogue with an, with an Iran that conducts its policies as a national state with a great history and great capacities and which could be a major influence for peace, progress, and stability. And we have to be able to conduct both of these policies simultaneously and to avoid getting into a position in which we are now in danger of falling that, uh, that the Sunni states vocally distrust us and the Iranians have not shifted or adopted a concept of international order with which we, uh, which with, which we can connect. Uh, and that has to be our objective. And to maintain a position in both the Sunni and in the Shia world. And that will be very difficult to do. Uh, uh, but I think it's possible. And, and I think it's necessary. Henry, do you, let me just ask, do you, uh, you've posed the great question. What, which is, what's the domestic dynamic within Iran? Is this now a time when they want to find a practical solution for their historical cultural greatness and have a legitimate expression of that? Or is it still a revolutionary country that's looking to transform 
politics in their region. What do you think is the answer to that? I think it's probably both. Mm. Uh, it's probable that some of the uh, senior leaders and maybe and probably even the supreme leader are still mm -hmm. adhering to the revolutionary ideology of, uh, of Khomeini. But it also seems to be the case that the younger generation has more connections to the non-Islamic uh, international order uh, to have a different view and within uh, the system where I uh, differ from some of the literature that I read, it's, 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 it's uh, there are some people that one, one reads often that the Ayatollahs will go away and that we should just wait for them to, to go away and then something will happen that is more reasonable. Uh, I think we should be focusing on the expressions of Iranian foreign policy and not on their internal uh, uh, certification. And they should understand our objectives and our limits and, uh, and not assume that the overthrow of the existing system is the direct objective of American foreign policy. So, uh, so the major effort intellectually that we should make is to say what kind of foreign policy of Iran is compatible with American security and American objectives and pursue that uh, hopefully in the process and likely in the process the Iranian government will modify itself. Uh, in order to achieve this. Uh, I think back, and this is perhaps too uh, literal, uh, when we dealt with Nazis Egypt, uh, it was one faced some of the same revolutionary tendencies, not so religious as, as, uh, uh, as radical in, in general. And the American position at the time was, uh, we will judge you by your conduct. And we don't believe you can achieve your objectives with Russian military support. But if you are prepared to discuss on, a, uh, on another basis, we will be ready to uh, discuss an overall settlement with you and then uh, the Sadat policy was not a direct revolution within the system, although practically it brought about a, a total reorientation of uh, Egyptian policy. Uh, forgive me for asking such a crude question, but uh, can American politics handle such a sophisticated foreign policy? <laughs> Uh, I, I say it, no. Forgive me. I, 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 no, I think I think there are two answers to that. One, it it has to get to that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it cannot now, but for a number of understandable reasons, uh, we have not had in our history faced a situation in which the permanent calibration of a fluid situation became a principal objective necessity of American policy. Our foreign policy involvements have usually been, have invariably been in the face of an immediate danger mm. that could be overcome and afterwards we could return to stability. No other major nation has ever been yeah. in such a fortunate uh, position. Then we change our leadership so regularly and so totally when we change it, that every time a new administration comes in, one starts a re-examination 
of the entire policy, uh, while in fact a successful foreign policy has to be a continuum that you can modify in the light of experience, but not something which you can pretend you can recast every four or eight years. Yeah. But I think we have to get ourselves into uh, the position uh, where we can do this. If one looks at Britain in the 19th century, and you look at the succession of prime ministers from different parties, uh, and the substantially continuous foreign policy they maintained, that is sort of an objective which mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have not yet reached. This is why our motto is, in God we trust. Okay. Uh, let me ask one last question, and I will turn to the audience. Uh, Henry, you, you are a, a, a policy strategist that has grounded yourself in an understanding of history. This is a region of profound historical impact. We've got a, a 300 year relationship between Turkey and Russia, uh, between Turkey and the, the, uh, the Levant. We, have, we come into this with a very superficial kind of a historical consciousness. Um, what is your sense about how we should be working with the uh, other powers in the world that have historically had a greater Im uh, involvement and impact in this region? And how would you first approach it? Well, of course, if you look at the 300-year history of Russia and Turkey, you cannot say that they have been brilliant in solving it's their problems. It's not been happy. No, it's not been happy. Between themselves. <laughs> so having experience with each other can also teach you constant conflict. Uh, the uniqueness of the present world situation is that uh, in many regions, a permanent conflict mm. will lead to disaster for everybody. Mm -hmm. I would say that's particularly true between China and the, and the, the, the United States. Uh, and if one, if one looks at the crisis in the Middle East now, it has many similarities to the 30 years war in Europe. Where, uh, can, where, where religions, countries uh, were f fighting against each other with sometimes overlapping and sometimes different wars. And at the end of it, uh, out of that horrifying experience, which killed about 30% uh, of the population of Central Europe, with, not with weapons of mass destruction, they came up with the Westphalian settlement, which created a, a, a framework that lasted for a few hundred years. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying the same will happen in the Middle East, but the objective of foreign policy should be to distill out of these crises some pattern that will that can be maintained by the agreement of the of the principal countries. At this moment, it looks very hopeless when you look at the Paris events. Uh, but I'm hoping that uh, that we in America, regardless of which party wins will begin to focus on, on concentrating on a long-range policy when we come in. And, and many of our European allies, certainly Britain and France, have a long experience 
but have in effect resigned from the management of of the uh, crisis. Uh, so I'm not saying that I know exactly how to do this, uh, but I think if we set ourselves set objective, and we also have to understand that as time goes on, when we're talking about the Middle East, it is very probable that India will play a more active role because its own internal survival is very much dependent, uh, affected by what happens uh, to the radicalization in the region. And China in, uh, will begin to, to uh, play a strategic role, if not a, and all of this will have to be thought through mm -hmm. as, uh, uh, as, the, as the new world emerges. We are too focused on a world that was created by a few European countries 150 years ago in its structure. And we have now to understand what the new forces are, what our necessities are, and what our limitations are. And that doesn't mean that I'm sitting here knowing how to do it. Uh, but we've got to ask the right questions before we can give uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the answers. And we still remain the key element in, in devising this. I've been very selfish. I've indulged myself uh, at your expense because uh, I've had so many questions. But let me turn to the audience. And I do want to ask a few questions, and we will open it up. Uh, but, sir, there, there's, his hand is up prominently. It, only questions, by the way. If you start giving lectures, I'm going to cut you off and humiliate you. <laughs> so only questions, OK? Are you saying yes. you are permitted to ask questions, too? No, <laughs> sir. I will interpret the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe Graziano with DOD Inspector General. Thank you, Dr. Kissinger, for, uh, for being here. Uh, a little closer. Lift it up a little closer. Yes. In the aftermath of the bombings in Paris, the greatest concern among through European politicians seems to be a potential turn towards rightist parties and policies by the public. Uh, what is your assessment? You know, sort of, will that happen? And perhaps more importantly, should that happen in Europe? Thank you, sir. So, uh, I think his question is: Is will will the terrorist incidents create an impulse towards a reactionary rightist direction in Europe? No, that will there certainly be an initial impetus in that direction. Uh, but I hope that the Europeans will generate a leadership uh, in which they assume uh, a political role uh, without going to the extreme, uh, to the extreme uh, right or left wing parties. The immediate impact will be towards the right. Uh, right back here with a red tie. Uh, please stand up so we, that way that my microphone guy can find you. Uh, thank you. Peter Shutley, a retired State Department. I think it was Jefferson that said, a democracy to work needs an informed electorate. I'm not sure our electorate is very much informed about foreign affairs, so my question to you is, what's your assessment of that? Are we as stupid as we look? Is, uh... <laughs> no, 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 don't say that. <laughs> In evaluating motivations, just ask yourself, what motivation do I have to answer any of these questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, one of the differences between 19th century democracy and 21st century democracy 
It's that the issues uh, in 19th century democracy were relatively simpler and were not uh, so global. And therefore, uh, it was possible to reduce to reduce them to a number of key principles. This was especially true in domestic policy, but it was also true in, very much true in, in foreign policy. Now the elements that impinge on foreign policy are so widespread and cover so many different fields uh, that to present a relevant picture to the public is increasingly difficult. And I think also that the modern form of technology, which puts a premium on forming an opinion by a quick look at a screen, uh, which presents the essence in a very condensed form, appeals more to emotion than the more rationalist approach of the Enlightenment, which uh, uh, Jefferson represented. So the nature of modern democracy and modern information technology is one of the issues of our time. Uh, l l let me go back right, right down here in the second row, please. Let's try this. Henry Newsom, Secor Holdings. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, thanks very much for the excellent presentation. You lamented the, uh, the effect of quadrennial elections on our foreign policy and noted that it forces an oscillation between two extremes or at least different policy. Might a reversal of the migration of power of, of the last seven decades of power from the executive to the legislature, excuse me, from the legislature to the executive <laughs> mitigate that? You know, I have here the gate. Yes, uh, I think the, pardon me, sir? I'm happy to repeat. No, I, I think no, the let him simply try to me. I think the question is, is that with the debate that's going on, we've had this oscillation of domestic power between the executive branch and the legislative branch. It's shifted so much to the executive branch, and yet it seems to be captured by, you know, passions of... Uh, of one party. What do you think about how do we strike a balance for America, where American democracy reflects itself in foreign policy? And if, if, you, if the legislature had more power, would you have? If the legislature had more power, would you have a greater continuum in policy? Because you had commented that the presidential elections break that continuum. Well, uh, when I first had a significant position here in the Nixon administration. I thought life was tough. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it was. But the congressional organization was such that there were a number of senior members of the, that were the heads of committees that had been there for a long time. So it was possible. Uh, to conduct a national dialogue uh, when, when the leadership in Congress becomes more transitory and it then it's more affected by the immediate mood of foreign policy. And what the democratic process has to do in general is, is to respond to the immediate reaction on the one hand, but it also has to put the immediate reaction into a wider context, and that wider context has to become part of the thinking of the people at large, and that uh, is one of the issues that CSIS will help solve for the next. <laughs> <laughs> that's tomorrow. I'm going to reserve the last question for somebody below the age of 30. Okay, I mean, that's a, okay, right back here. You got the, 
a little, you know, you know, I got no, I got a guy here. He's going to ask a question. He's, you're too old. You go. Hi, um, Mr. Kissinger. Um, my name is Andrew Lama. I'm a freshman. You have fresh to speak up. Sorry. We can't hear you. Hi, I'm a freshman at George Washington University. Um, my name is Andrew Lama, and I just had a question. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a supporter of the Westphalian order, um, but also as somebody who diagnoses uh, artificial borders as a reason for why we have a lot of instability in the Middle East, um, how do you approach uh, how the, the readjustment of power um, with self-determination um, and, and how uh, uh, conflicts have to be solved um, with, with, with uh, minority um, groups in, in countries that uh, may not recognize self-determined peoples such as Turkey and Kurdistan? Um, or Iraq and Kurdistan, and uh, how we approach, um, how we shouldn't be looking at national sovereignty as this um, absolute, um, but we should be looking to uh, human sovereignty. Thank you. This, this was a very interesting question, because what he asked was, uh, the international system drew borders for other people, and it created a political instability in this region that's now showing up. And I think the question is, do we, uh, what do we do about that? Because we created uh, an inherent instability with an imperial dynamic that was in creating the boundaries in the Middle East. But does it get better if we try to change it? What do you think? Well, first of all, if you look at history, uh, the borders in the medieval period, borders were not drawn on the basis of nationality. They were based on the feudal tradition mm -hmm. and countries, whole sections of countries could be moved to other countries. Uh, and that was considered a normal way of operating the international system. The notion of boundaries drawn on the basis of national identity and cultural identity really began to develop in the 18th century and gained momentum only in the 19th uh, uh, century. Uh, the Austrian Empire was considered a perfectly natural phenomenon in the 18th century and became outdated in the 19th century when the nation state uh, became uh, the key element. Now, at the end of World War I, the European victors of World War I carved up the Middle East on the model of the European system, but that meant a number of states of roughly equal size who would balance each other but that were no longer buttressed by a common sense of nationality. So these countries uh, were inherently rickety. And uh, it is therefore uh, very unlikely that if you look at it from a historical point of view, that the national boundaries as we know them now of countries like Iraq and Syria that had never existed before will have the same significance in a new international uh, system. But the problem is when you change the boundaries, you, you, you create a, uh, uh, a, a period of, of tension in the There has never been an Iraq before 1920. And it was composed of Kurds, Sunnis, and Shia. So in a, in a world system based on national identity, you can imagine that Iraq would break up over a period of time. But to do that peacefully is a... Uh, it's a huge challenge. And then when you add to the fact that what is now an autonomous Kurdish region borders significant Kurdish minorities in Turkey, Iran, and Syria, uh, you, you have 
and another complication. Uh, that's one of the issues of our time. One would hope that the leading countries get together on some system of reconstructing the states uh, that has some, uh, some viability. Uh, but it's a very, it, it, it's a very tough, uh, tough thing. And I really want to say to this group, I mean, it's, I didn't know what I was being invited for. <laughs> and if I had, I would probably have Said no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> stayed in China <laughs> where I was a week ago. <laughs> but uh, these are important issues, and I don't want to give you the impression that I'm here pontificating because I know all the answers. Uh, what we have to do now is agree on a direction and agree on what it is we want to solve mm. and what its components need to be uh, instead of repeating the slogans that, uh, that have gotten us into, in, into this position. And it's going to be a painful process, but it's an essential process. And so really, we, uh, it's not my normal habit that I say I know the questions better than the answers. Uh, but, but that really is uh, uh, the challenge that's before us. What, what you do for us, uh, Henry, is you, um, you bring us into a different dimension to think about problems in a strategic way. And uh, that's what's missing right now in America. We're so busy trying to propagandize our own point of view rather than to listen and to think strategically. You've given us a wonderful opportunity this afternoon to think strategically. Can I ask all of you to thank Henry Kissinger? <laughs>